Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm thrilled to be here tonight and, um, and really thrilled to see the Freeport Historical Society um, take up the, the charge of organizing um, programming around this uh, history that, as we know, has been deeply suppressed uh, for a couple hundred years, and especially uh, love that you all are uh, really engaging with the idea of uh, bringing in, creating a citizen historian group um, and getting the community involved in this process. Um, so I really look forward to talking with you tonight about Atlantic Black Box, what it is, um, and uh, how you can get involved. I want to start, though, by thanking a couple other people, Audrey Wolf, um, and especially Jewel Gordeaux, uh, an old friend um, who uh, her connection to this story, um, to this history, is uh, it's both by virtue of living in Freeport um, and because uh, she was a longtime uh, summer visitor on Cape Cod, where I am from. Uh, and so the two communities that we'll be looking at sort of closely tonight, um, you could say that Jewel Gordo Whelan uh, is, um, you know, got the double whammy uh, in terms of uh, getting some bad news about these places um, that I, I know um, she's been very attached to. Um, so first, just briefly, uh, I wanted to sketch for you in broad strokes what Atlantic Black Box is. Um, we are based in Portland, Maine. We are a nonprofit. Uh, we have, however, a region-wide ambition to, uh, to encourage individuals and institutions throughout New England to really pick up a shovel and begin digging right where they are at the micro local level and to ask some very basic questions. What happened here in this town? Who lived here? You know, are there members of the community whose presence has been relegated to the margins or absolutely effaced um, over the course of time? Uh, who, how did, how did the, these prominent citizens uh, who, after whom streets are named and schools and libraries, how did they make their money? Um, and these are questions, of course, that um, one could say it, it's a matter of knowing you know, our place and, and um, developing a, a, a real relationship uh, with place. But somehow these are questions that we have, generally speaking, uh, failed to, to ask and certainly failed to ask in a sustained way over time. So Atlantic Black Box um, exists to as a, as a corrective um, to that failure to investigate. Uh, and we are a public history project, a coalition driven by a shared commitment to truth um, we are a coalition then of scholars, uh, independent researchers, uh, racial justice activists, artists, performers, uh, public history professionals, um, students, senior citizens, uh, volunteers uh, who are committed to truth, uh, to answering some of those basic questions that I, I just sketched. And why, um, why a historical recovery project at the grassroots level? Well, um, as, as many of you who were present at last, week's, uh, at last month's presentation by uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Kate McMahon, uh, as, as you have come to understand the history of, of these towns such as Freeport, in Portland uh, or Brewster on Cape Cod, where I'm from, uh, it we have failed to 
sufficiently investigate historians uh, who have in who have written books on these uh, on these towns on this region uh, failed to uh, failed to bring to light the deep investment and complicity in a sustained way uh, in the economy of enslavement and the slave trade more broadly. And so if we're waiting around for historians uh, to do this work, well, we've already waited a couple hundred years. So, um, so we are calling on citizen historians to get curious and participate actively in this process, which we consider to be really a matter of civic duty. Um, practically speaking, Atlantic Black Box is looking to serve as a very accessible online repository, a place where we can all share our findings, what we're learning so that we can enlighten one another. And uh, as a common platform where we can share our stories of our really chronicle this journey of historical recovery. Um, so if, if you were present uh, for Kate McMahon's presentation last month, or if you were able to see a recording, you maybe learned some very bad news uh, that in fact, you know, um, some of the most prominent figures at the heart of Freeport's um, community were in fact involved in illicit slave trading, namely Rufus Soule, who uh, the first time I visited the Freeport Histori Historical Society, uh, who was presented to me as the honorable Rufus Soule, um, a man I was told who was highly respected, um, highly thought of within the community. Uh, he was considered, and I'm quoting, a straight dealer, a man you could trust. Um, and so what Kate has revealed through her research is that um, this notion of the upright citizen uh, was absolutely false, uh, that, that it, uh, the aspect of, of, of his life and legacy that went untold was um, the perpetration of crimes against humanity uh, for which he could have been prosecuted severely, but uh, wasn't as was the case for so many in our region. And I know that this comes as really difficult news to swallow for many. I understand and I can relate. I myself was the bearer of bad news in my own hometown on Cape Cod. Um, when I discovered that the most celebrated sea captain from Brewster uh, and from Cape Cod, uh, that he was in fact uh, involved in illicit slave trading himself. Um, and the community uh, reacted in, in different ways uh, to this research. But I wanted to share a little bit of that story with you because, um, because I think that if, uh, on one hand, it, it is, it's the incident that prompted the creation of Atlantic Black Box. So it's very much the backstory to uh, this undertaking. Um, but also to let you know, you know, Freeport is absolutely not alone. This uh, is a systemic problem throughout coastal New England and, uh, and throughout New England period, because it wasn't only the coastal towns that were complicit in the economy of enslavement. And I think it's also important to underscore uh, the, the, the story that I'm gonna share with you uh, this evening. It helps us to contextualize a bit, you know, what it, what is the impact? You know, what are the implications of not knowing this history? And what is the potential impact on people throughout the region? If you had been standing on Boston's Longworth 
202 years ago on August 1st, 1819, you would have smelled it long before you saw it. The putrid odor that blew into the harbor that day made the entire city sick to its stomach. Dock workers, well accustomed to unpleasant odors, suddenly found themselves doubled over, wrapped in a sickly embrace so suffocating they would talk about it for years to come. Even customs agents sitting in their stately offices were not spared the revolting stench. Merchants, laundresses, candle makers, street kids, if you were human and you had a nose, you could not help but stop whatever it was you were doing to scan the horizon for the source of the corruption. And then it appeared, the 10 brothers, the long awaited tall ship belonging to some of the biggest names in Boston shipping, Humphrey, Lyman, Dodge and Thorndike, whose father uh, was, he had absolutely made part of his fortune in the slave trade. When these essentially trust fund kids had launched their joint venture 11 months earlier, they had expected it to re reap major profits. And now their ship had finally come in. Only mortifyingly, it reeked to high heaven. Worst of all, from an investor's point of view anyway, there was very little cargo in the holds. Mostly it was just stones and ballast. It's a matter of common remark that no ship has arrived in our harbor for many years in so foul a state as the 10 brothers attested one witness. It has been stated by people of veracity that the ship was extremely foul, echoed another, so as to be offensive to the senses, even when coming up the harbor. What exactly had happened on board this ship after its crew of Cape Cod men pulled anchor and sailed for Sierra Leone 11 months earlier on September 1st, 1818? What cargo had the vessel carried from West Africa to the West Indies? And what could have imbued its every timber with a putrescence so revolting that no amount of scrubbing or fumigating could successfully mask the horrific stench? Well, within days of the ship's return to Boston following its 11 month voyage, the population's, uh, the population's disgust quickly turned to terror as sailors and dock workers having had any contact with the ship turned a shocking shade of yellow and started to bleed from every orifice before dying in contorted fits of agony. One 19th century commentator often offered an account that might sound eerily familiar to us today, now that we have witnessed the devastating impact of COVID-19 on communities in Boston and in Northern New England. There were instances in Boston the last summer where one after another in a family was suffered to sicken and die with scarcely a friend to administer the medicine which was prescribed by the physician. Neighbors were afraid to aid each other, although in reality exposed to the same common danger. And brother was afraid to visit brother. Strangers closed the eyes of the dying and hurried them to the grave as soon as the last breath was drawn. 202 years ago, a collective tragedy played out right here in coastal New England, much like the one we're currently experiencing on a global scale. Only in the summer of 1819, it was not the coronavirus that was wreaking havoc on the population. It was the yellow fever virus. And just as investigators today have been able to trace the source of Boston's 2020 outbreak of COVID-19 to that fateful Biogen conference at the Marriott Long Wharf Hotel that led to roughly uh, 20,000 cases of COVID in four Massachusetts counties by early May. In that same way, the source of the yellow fever outbreak that ravaged Boston's waterfront two centuries ago was patently obvious to public health officials of the day. In fact, it seems the entire city was unanimous in accusing the ship, the 10 brothers, of carrying a plague in the place of a cargo. While a lot of folks have turned to history for answers 
about how we might handle our present challenge, uh, our challenges with respect to COVID-19. Most have sought to draw lessons from the devastating influenza pandemic of 1918. So why is no one talking about the epidemic that took place 100 years earlier in 1819? And the answer is because it got left out of the history books. I wanna tell you that four years ago, I had never heard of the 10 brothers, although its captain and crew all hailed from my hometown of Brewster on Cape Cod, nor did I know the first thing about New England's role in the slave trade. My training was in literature, not history, but everything changed one day when I decided to take a shortcut through the cemetery in my old childhood neighborhood. And I happened upon a white marble headstone where it was inscribed, Benjamin Crosby died in Africa in 1795. Africa, what was Crosby doing there? I wondered. I had spent six years myself in West Africa straight out of college. And although I was cautious not to jump to any conclusions, I felt quite certain that our motivations in going, Crosby's and my own, were worlds apart. And it occurred to me to ask, could Benjamin Crosby have been involved in the slave trade? Well, um, I went to the library and pursued that question. I found no books in the catalog. I went to the Brewster Historical Society. I found no answers among the director and staff. Um, I went to the town hall, to the historic town vaults, and I consulted all of my town's records from 1700, um, suffering the cold stare of the town clerk who was not so happy to have to retrieve these documents for me. Um, and I asked my friends and family, anyone who would listen, were we involved in the slave trade? What I got were uh, a number of different types of responses. First, uh, absolute denial. No, definitely not. We were not involved in the slave trade. The second was a type of equivocation. Well, and this from folks who, uh, who are familiar with the region's history, they would tell me we were not slave trading. However, we were trading in the West Indies. But the way they described it made it sound as though this were some sort of benevolent activity um, the third type of response was a sort of shrug, a kind of indifference. Well, uh, I guess it shouldn't surprise us if they were slave trading. And it was that last response of all of them uh, that I found most troubling because uh, I felt that uh, really, yeah, maybe it shouldn't surprise us, it should actually horrify us to learn this. The sign that you're looking at right now was carved by my own father, uh, stone carver, and he carved in the old style many of the stones that are in the cemetery um, behind this sign. It's the Lower Road Cemetery where many of my town's sea captains were buried. Uh, and so uh, one of the things that I, I did because I had found no documentation in the library or the historical society, no smoking guns that we were slave trading, but I had found that original headstone that suggested Benjamin Crosby had been present in Africa at a time when slave trading was the essential trade uh, in the region. I went back to the cemeteries and I walked them uh, stone by stone, my town's oldest cemeteries. And there inscribed in stone, I found mention after mention of place of death. And I systematically noted this down, where did people die? And then I cross-referenced my findings with the town's vital records. And I found a number of fascinating things. So I would urge everyone to, uh, to, to just uh, get out there and um, do this exercise. Uh, the first thing I found was that more men from my hometown had died in Havana, Cuba 
than had died anywhere else in the world aside from Brewster. So then the next question was, what were they all doing in Cuba? Uh, why did there appear to be a feeding frenzy in Cuba uh, among Cape Cod men in the early half of the 19th century? Uh, that was a question I could research. And that's how I discovered that an emerging field of scholarship of which Kate McMahon is a part, uh, scholars were working to uncover New England's role in the slave trade and what we call the economy of enslavement or the global uh, slave economy. So uh, this commodities trading in the Atlantic world and well beyond um, that was fueled by um, enslaved labor. Another thing that I discovered as I was just asking these questions around town, you know, I, I was told at the Historical Society that no, we were not slave trading, um, but there were a couple other Brewster captains who had been to Africa, uh, namely Captain Elijah Cobb, who, as I mentioned, uh, is the most highly celebrated sea captain of all of Cape Cod. His memoir was published in 1925 by Yale University Press. Um, he's considered sort of a paragon of the, the style. Um, and I thought, well, fantastic. He's written a memoir. So, um, so I'll get to read about his African voyages. And I read the memoir end to end. And uh, thank goodness it was the 1925 edition that I that uh, Amazon sent me and not the 2011 version um, because Elijah Cobb in his memoir says nothing about having traveled to Africa. Uh, no mention is made of the African voyages at all, except in the appendix where the man who edited this volume, Ralph Payne, happened to append a couple of letters that Elijah Cobb had written to his wife and son uh, from the coast of West Africa during this one particular voyage that took place between 1818 and 1819. Uh, so the fact that he left out of his memoir, the African voyages of which we know that there were at least two um, caused me to ask, well, that's strange. Why would he have done that? Um, his grandson had written a note saying he did that because uh, he was his, his health didn't allow him to recount the final eight years of his seafaring career uh, between 1812 and 1820. Um, but I soon discovered that, that was not true. Um, he continued to write letters to his family members well after he stopped writing his memoir. Elijah Cobb, uh, in addition to being you know, a celebrated sea captain, held so many prominent roles within the town. He basically uh, filled every possible role. He was, um, he was town clerk, he was justice of the peace, he was uh, a senator and representative to the Massachusetts State Legislature. He was uh, inspector, sorry, he was a general, um, a brigadier general in the army. Uh, so highly decorated. Uh, and here is his house. Um, it was in 2017 that his home right on Lower Road near the cemetery uh, that I showed you. His home, uh, the renovations were completed and this house that he had built in 1799 became home to the Brewster Historical Society, which naturally you know, was very proud um, to, uh, pr proud of the man of the house. Um, and I, uh, you know, I was the real fly in the soup, I guess, um, when I came around, you know, trying to find documents that would have filled this chest that you're looking at. Um, so you might call this a 19th century black box. Uh, it is a document chest that is presumed to have accompanied him on board 
his many voyages, which took place over the course of 40 years at sea. So think about the fact that this man cared tremendously about his legacy. Uh, he cared so much about his legacy that he wrote a memoir, right? Um, and yet his document chest is empty. I use this symbolically to evoke the reality that it is, if, if you go looking in archives of the region, uh, whether it's uh, the Brewster Historical Society or the, the town vault or the Massachusetts Historical Society or beyond, you will not find Elijah Cobb's primary source documents. Where did all of his logs go, his, his ship logs go? Where did his correspondence over the years go? His account books. What, what happened to all of that documentation? Gone. As if it had been thrown overboard. Um, so what I discovered as I began to uh, consult other types of documents, namely uh, newspapers, and the like to try to figure out what Elijah Cobb had been doing in West Africa in 1818, I discovered uh, that he had been accused of two heinous crimes on one hand, uh, accused by the people of Boston of contraband slave trading. And this accusation was made in the newspapers, in the most prominent newspapers of, of, of the time. Actually, sorry, let me restate that. His, it's not the accusation, uh, the rebuttal, his rebuttal to these accusations. Um, he was also accused of knowingly bringing the plague to Boston. In other words, sailing a diseased vessel, a vessel that he knew carried disease, um, evading quarantine regulations at Rainsford Island, and sailing it into Boston's Long Wharf to the very same place where the 2020 outbreak of COVID-19 uh, took place, that super spreader event at the Biogen conference that I mentioned earlier. Um, so Elijah Cobb, uh, this, he, I, I, I won't tell you the whole story, um, that would take another couple of hours, but I wanted to, um, highlight this story um, to show, you know, that a, a, a number of things. What got left off of the historical record in the case of this man was um, a public health crisis of, of major um, import, right? a public health crisis that affected not only Boston, but the Eastern seaboard. Uh, because when he sailed that vessel into Boston's harbor, uh, the uh, folks, as I described uh, at, the, at the opening, uh, the longshoremen, the uh, customs officials came on board the vessel. Uh, they were bit by mosquitoes that were carrying the yellow fever virus. Then those same people, boarded other vessels that were docked at Long Wharf. Um, they were bit by other mosquitoes. Now those mosquitoes carried the virus as well, and so on and so on. And the vessels that were in port um, during that period when the 10 brothers arrived, um, they all went off to other, uh, to other ports and became vectors in turn of this virus. It was extremely deadly. Uh, the year 1819, uh, essentially you could call it an Atlantic world pandemic that occurred that year. Have you heard of it? Did you know about it? No, it's extraordinary. This has not been documented. It hasn't been written about and yet it occurred and we can find it um, easily in the record of the time, you know, in by triangulating with different types of documents. Elijah Cobb chose not to write about it. Uh, I suppose unsurprisingly, but what is surprising 
is the fact that he came back to Cape Cod after all of this took place. Everyone in town at the time would have known that Elijah Cobb had been accused of these two heinous crimes. Seven Brewster men died on this journey. Those families would have been grieving. Um, did they hold him accountable? Did they run him out of town? No, this is precisely the moment at which they covered him in honors. So that's interesting. What we have essentially is not only the growth of a conspiracy of silence around this incident, it's much more than an incident, but complicity on the part of the community. We're not going to talk about this. And they didn't. And so it did not live on in collective memory in the town of Brewster. It didn't make its way into the historical record. And so it couldn't serve us today, one could say, when we most need it, but it couldn't serve us uh, throughout all of those years as a cautionary tale, one about greed, uh, rabid greed. Uh, and what it leads to. And I, this is just an example. This is one story among so many. Um, and I, I think for those of you um, who attended Kate's talk, uh, you, you can probably hear a resonance um, in what I've described about Elijah Cobb uh, in thinking about Rufus' soul um, and how, you know, a figure who's at the very the center of a community, you know, to, to realize that they were in fact um, involved in such heinous crimes uh, is extremely jarring, but we, we can't stop there. We need to uh, think about the fact that in, in the day of Rufus Soul, as Kate pointed out, this was, you know, word of his activities made its way into newspapers uh, in, uh, I believe in the New York Times, Kate can um, uh, contradict me in the, um, in the Q and A if, if I got that wrong, but prominent newspapers, people of the day knew this. So what we need to ask ourselves is how did we come to unknow our history and what are the implications of that? Um, I know this is a bold statement to say that New England doesn't know its history, but really what we can say with certainty and what scholars will tell you is that we do not know the most important things there are to know about New England, how it made its wealth, its extensive and longstanding investment in the Atlantic world uh, economy of enslavement. And <clears throat> by this, I mean, uh, participation by our Northern shipbuilders, seamen, merchants, and bankers in the transatlantic and the domestic slave trades. Also the enslavement of indigenous and African descended peoples throughout the Northeast. This complicity is also uh, expressed in the exploitation of enslaved labor through what was euphemistically referred to as the coastwise or provisioning trade in connection with the brutal sugar and coffee plantations of the West Indies and the American South. Uh, so as you've all witnessed, the history wars are really raging uh, throughout our country today. Uh, and, and have been uh, for the past couple of years prompted by a confluence of events. There is in short, a growing acknowledgement that we as a nation have gotten the story very wrong, that we have been passing down a sanitized, whitewashed version of our history. What we're experiencing is a massive awakening to the fact that the past is not past at all. It is very present with us and a realization that until we properly reckon with our nation's deep history of exploitation, expropriation and extermination, we cannot write ourselves an equitable future. In this raging battle over 
who, whose stories are told, who is remembered. I argue that we here in New England have a, uh, a real problem, uh, maybe a bigger problem than the towns in the American South that have very obvious Confederate statues uh, that they can discuss uh, whether or not to tear down. Because here we don't have such obvious markers of our racist past. And it's, that's a handicap on our journey of historical recovery because the very invisibility of our complicity has meant that we have been operating for centuries on a false notion of what happened here and who we are collectively as New Englanders. We have been passing down stories that are not based in fact, but rather in fantasies about bracing adventures of hardworking upright citizens um, who took to the high seas and who earned every penny that they acquired. Um, but at the same time, we have been ignoring a staggering pile of evidence that would contradict those very stories and fly in the face of our region's dominant narrative where we Northerners were staunchly on the right side of history. We have enough evidence and we have had to demystify that notion for a very long time, but we have chosen not to. So there's no doubt, but that um, ignorance <laughs> here in the United States is, one could say, epidemic when it comes to history. Um, but right here in New England, we have a real commitment to preserving history to the point where many of our towns are sort of like living museums. Um, we just need to begin, we at Atlantic Black Box insist, we just need to begin by asking ourselves some of the most basic questions. Right? So for example, now that we know that slavery existed in Maine, we have to ask, when did it begin? And if anyone here can begin answering these questions, please throw them into the chat. Um, when did slavery end in Maine? Do you know? How many people were enslaved in Freeport or in Maine? What forms of work were they forced to do? What was the experience of enslavement like here? What are the names of some of the people who were enslaved in my town? What are their names? Where were they buried? Where did they live? How did these people resist their enslavement? Because you can be certain that they did. And another very interesting question to ask, uh, one for which it is not at all hard to find results, uh, re research, you know, results is how did my town vote in the 1860 election? So if you don't know the answers to these questions, let me ask another one. Do you think that it's worth knowing? Do you think that these are viable questions for which we should know the answers? This is an excerpt from the Massachusetts Body of Liberties, which of course applied uh, to Maine as well, being a province of Massachusetts. We're very proud of this document written in 1641 uh, because here we have inscribed the very commitment to liberty uh, that we hold so dear as one of our foundations of our democratic principles here in the United States. There shall never be any bond slavery, villainage or captivity amongst us. That is something to be proud of. But the document goes on. There shall never be any bond slavery, villainage, or captivity amongst us unless it be lawful captive, captives taken in just wars and such strangers as willingly sell themselves or are sold to us. What happens when we leave out that part of the story. That's what we've been doing. When it comes to the slave trade, 
Maine played an outsized role as Kate McMahon's research is beginning to reveal. So when I say Massachusetts here, we include Maine in that, um, but also I should have actually written, when did people from Massachusetts and Maine begin participating in the slave trade? For how long did they pursue this inhuman trade? How many Massachusetts and Maine built vessels were actually implicated in the slave trade? How many captive Africans did these vessels carry to the Americas? Does anyone know answers to these questions? Are they questions worth asking, worth answering? How can we answer these questions? It's going to require a lot of research and as phenomenal as Kate is and a total um, amazing researcher, she can't find all of the answers herself. There is just not enough time and there are too many vessels that were involved in slave trading. So. Uh, to give you a sense, uh, this is just some basics, what we know of um, from slavevoyages.org. I encourage all of you to uh, go to that site, especially the educators among you. Slavevoyages.org has many wonderful resources for educators, uh, for working with students of various ages with this um, difficult history. As you can see, 90% of all legal slaving voyages under the US flag were out of Massachusetts, Maine, and Rhode Island. Uh, but what we have here represented are just the known transatlantic slaving voyages out of New England. And uh, as Kate and other colleagues know well, this is just the tip of the iceberg. The metaphor of the black box, um, we evoke this uh, to to signify uh, our sense of, of the archive and the role of history, right? So what is a black box? It's one of those devices uh, meant to record critical flight data on an aircraft uh, that were installed as of the 1960s. So that in the event of a crash, a terrible accident, if you could locate the black box, you could gather that data, you could reconstitute it, and you could figure out what caused the crash. It's a form of historical recovery. And you could say that the black box is an archive right? because it holds that historical data. Um, but the purpose of the black box, the purpose of recording history is not to do history for history's sake. And it's not to pass on pleasant stories to our children. The purpose is as this example so well shows, it's to prevent tragedy from happening again. Why is our black box empty in New England? Well, you know, many will tell you that, uh, that so many of our primary source documents related to uh, New England's maritime trade went up in flames, whether it was Boston and in the big fire of 1872 or Portland's own fire that took the customs house, accidents happened, it's true. But uh, that does not explain the dearth of primary documents uh, in our archives. We know that sabotage, deliberate suppression of information is also a factor. But I wanna emphasize, not everything burned. We have cemeteries, we have newspapers, we have many ways of collecting data information. It's really a question of asking the right questions, asking them in a sustained way, also working with other community members, um, getting folks working together, collaborating. Hey, I found this thing. What do you make of it? Do you know anything about it? Um, because we all do better when we, uh, when we work together and we have multiple eyes on. So with that, I'm just going to stop and I'd love to take your questions and have conversation about what it will take for us to build a better box 
here in Maine, here in New England, um, and why that um, why that's something for all of us to collaborate on. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share. And I see Leanne's hand up. So I'm sorry, I was late to the presentation. I got tied up with something else, but um, I've been looking at your work for a while because I have come across some information that I think I could contribute to this black box. And I'm wondering what's the best way to do that? Terrific, thank you for the question. Really excited to hear uh, that you've got some findings to share. So we have um, on our on our site uh, under the log books, um, check it out. This is a multi-author blog uh, where people who are doing this research can chronicle their journeys of historical recovery. So we would love to invite you, Leanne, um, to take up some blog space and to share what you're finding. I mean, there are no there are no parameters. Like you could write as short or as long a piece as you want. That's the beauty of a blog. Um, you could write as frequently or as infrequently, maybe just you know once. Or it, there are no restrictions. We just welcome your um, we welcome your your story um, and. Eventually, we, we are going to have other methods, collection methods available to people, databases uh, to which folks can contribute and that sort of thing. So those are in the works. But for now, we would love it if you'd consider blogging. So like images of ships, perhaps, and Absolutely. any of that sort of stuff. And OK. Absolutely. And uh, I just want to invite Kate also to chime in at any point. Um, and also, I saw that there are some other great friends of Atlantic Black Box here, so anyone can feel free to, to jump in. Um, but I see Anna's hand up. Yeah, thank you so much. This was um, fascinating and amazing. So thank, thanks so much. Um, I was just curious if you could share any reflections. I appreciated the personal story and how um, you asking questions, sort of what you encountered in terms of responses in your own, the community where you came from. And I'm curious if there's any additional sort of um, points or commentary on how, the, whether there's been additional reflections or openness or sort of how how the story has continued to unfold um, for folks um, in, the, in the community you, you grew up in, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Um... It's been really encouraging. I, I, I won't pretend that there hasn't been a lot of resistance. Um, I will say resistance here in New England doesn't typically take the form of folks showing up, you know, with pitchforks trying to, you know, run, run scholars or, or uh, out of town who are saying things they don't like to hear. Um, but it's more like it, I compare it to the sound of a door quietly shutting in your face. Um, there has, however, been a lot of support. So um, I measure that in the number of times um, I and other colleagues have been invited to give talks um, on Cape Cod, for example. Um, right there in Brewster, in my hometown, the, the church, um, the First Parish Church, where I saw that original headstone, a group, a racial justice group connected to, to what is now a UU church um, at the uh, congressional, the old congressional church, congregational rather, um, they formed a reparations committee. So a group of, of, of people got together and they began meeting regularly. They split into two different groups. One group was researching just the very question of reparations, like all the different forms it takes, what's the current debate in the country uh, and elsewhere around reparations. And the other group specifically, divide, they, they came up with a set of research tasks, um, things they wanted to understand. Who were the sea captains who were members of that church who were possibly involved in slave trading uh, or who uh, were enslavers themselves? Um, et cetera, As they had a set of questions and uh, they divvied up the work. And um, so they began this research and, and they're now you know, in conversation about how the church can make reparations. Uh, that's really encouraging. Um, 
Uh, Meta, uh, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one from Elizabeth is asking if you're familiar with the film Traces of the Trade mm -hmm. about the DeWolf family in Bristol, Rhode Island. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Katrina Brown is um, sort of a friend of Atlantic Black Box. In fact, Kate McMahon and I uh, met with Katrina at Kate's office at the National Museum of African American History and Culture back in the days when such things were possible. Um, and, uh, and I interviewed Katrina um, about her own experiences. You know, if you don't know this story, I encourage everyone to have a look at Traces of the Trade. Um, Katrina discovered that her family, the, the, her ancestors, the DeWolfs, were the worst uh, offenders, if you will, um, in the United States, the family that was most deeply involved in slave trading. Um, research has since suggested that maybe uh, they that claim to infamy um, goes to a different family, but in any event, uh, there is no doubt but that uh, the DeWolf family uh, were major, major players in the slave trade. And in her film, Traces of the Trade, you know, she brings together family members who are willing to engage the process of reckoning with how did we not know this or, or did we know? Did we know and did we hide it from ourselves? Human capacity for self-deception is, is really extraordinary. And, um, and but they they gathered. Um, she managed to get a group of uh, of her her family members together to actually go to Ghana, where the DeWolfs had a uh, a trading site, and uh, to Cuba, where they had plantations, um, sugar plantations run on the labor of enslaved Africans. Uh and there's an, another question uh, back about the diseased ship and whether there were enslaved people who survived from that ship um, or crew that survived. Um, and were there any manifests or crew logs or anything like that from the, from the 10 brothers? Yeah, so, um, so in that case, no documentation related to the actual voyage survives, but the, the letters that Elijah Cobb wrote to his wife and son, um, all other, you know, manifests, et cetera, disappeared um, mysteriously. As to whether or not enslaved people survived that journey, I, I said at the outset that it was a slaving voyage um, because that is my conclusion uh, after uh, years of researching this case. Um, and that is the accusation that was made when the disease ship sailed into Boston Harbor. The entire city, uh, it seems, was pointing the finger at this vessel and, and saying, this is a slaving vessel. Um, and yet, Elijah Cobb, uh, at, when a, the Boston Board of Health conducted an investigation, they found him not guilty. So uh, there was no legal proceeding, but uh, he was exonerated by the Board of Health, uh, which claimed that he couldn't have known that disease was on board the vessel, uh, that, and that, that this was an honorable voyage. In other words, that they did not believe that enslaved people had ever been on board the vessel. Uh, now, now, you know, um, how do I square that, that with what I've said that this was a, a slaving voyage? Well, the Boston Board of Health was not made up by physicians or scientists. It was made up by political appointees. Uh, and who were those people appointed by? Uh, by men of influence who had influence in 19th century Boston, the shipping class, right? The shipping elite. And, um, and as, uh, as scholars uh, who, st who study the slave trade know, customs agents, boards of health, et cetera, they were in the pockets of the merchant elite. Uh, 
But that's not the only evidence that I have that this was a slaving voyage or that the Board of Health was colluding to hide what had actually occurred on this vessel. Um, there is a lot of other evidence, um, which uh, you can hear about if, if you come to one of my disease ship talks or if you wait for me to finally write the book. Um, but uh, to the question specifically about enslaved people on board, I mean, this is what breaks my heart, right? Is there, it is so difficult to even talk about um, the, what happened in the hold. I can be 99.9% .9 sure that this was a slaving voyage, but who were those individuals that were on board? Um, what was their experience of the yellow fever outbreak as it was ravaging the captains and crews of the two vessels that were actually sailing in consort? You know, if, if seven Brewster men died and they were up above decks, how many died below decks? Uh, so it's, um, it's one of the tragic consequences of the way in which we have done history in New England that I actually can't tell you anything about those people that I am sure were there. And, you know, other, um, this is why, you know, people who are committed to trying to express the human experience of enslavement and uh, the middle passage across the Atlantic turn to fiction. They turn to fiction because, you know, uh, this is what I call, you know, a, part of the crime against humanity is it's not only the, the original crime of enslaving people and torturing them and uh, taking away their freedom, but it's also effacing their memory, making it almost impossible to, to evoke them in public memory. Um, so nonfiction, uh, scholarship has its limitations. Um, and so, uh, so some have turned to fiction. I feel very strongly in uh, conveying the diseased ship story. I don't want there to be any confusion. This is not fiction. This actually happened. Um, and so uh, it, I, you know, as I tell it, um, it's a true story. As I write it, I am going to, I am writing it as nonfiction, but it pains me to no end that there are these ellipses, there are these, these portions of the story that just can't be related. Um, Meta, we've talked a lot this evening uh, about the slave trade directly um, and its relationship uh, to folks that we know from New England uh, were participating in either the illicit trade transatlantically or the, the legal domestic slave trade. Uh, but Atlantic Black Box also talks about a concept that I think it's uh, really important to introduce, um, the Atlantic slave economy. And I think that's a much more helpful term for something that we um, in the past have referred to as the triangular trade at times. And I think that while the Atlantic slave economy makes it much more clear what we're talking about. Um, the, the triangular trade, although it, even just the, the clean geometric term um, sort of sanitizes what was actually going on. Uh, I think there was also the illusion that those of us in New England um, were at a point of a triangle that didn't really have anything to do with the other two points or the other sides. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the research that Atlantic Black Box is doing, not only to uncover New England's role directly in the slave trade, but also in the other parts of the Atlantic slave economy. Yeah, great, great question and really important point because 
you know, what, what we have in New England is um, a, a case where the, our involvement, our complicity, our investment in slavery was taking place offshore. It was taking place out of sight. So out of mind, right? There was this plausible deniability uh, that um, that was in effect essentially uh, because we were conducting this trade elsewhere. And when we came home, uh, the vessels got scraped, the documents got scrubbed, and people only, you know, what stays in on the Atlantic, what happens on the Atlantic stays on the Atlantic, I guess. Um, and, you know, I, I was astounded when my, I could finally get my head around the notion that we in New England had plantations. We had plantations. It's just that they were in the West Indies. They were in the Caribbean. Uh, you know, from the earliest, um, you know, moments uh, when of European, you know, settle, settlement in New England, when the colonizers came, there were Northern British colonies here in New England, and there were Southern British colonies in the West Indies. And a trade route was established right from the start uh, between these colonies, uh, such that, you know, in the Caribbean, these islands uh, were so, um, they were, the, the, the climate, the soil, everything was right for growing sugar, uh, they discovered. And so um, they clear cut them and essentially established a monoculture of, of sugar. Uh, we in, you know, in the West developed a sugar, sugar craving that seemingly couldn't be satisfied. It was called the white gold. Um, sugar was an extremely lucrative trade to the point where the Caribbean islands, you know, those European planters considered that it was, uh, you know, all land would be devoted to growing those crops so that everything else was imported, right? All other provisions. And so New England supplied those provisions, whether it was salt cod and salt herring to feed the enslaved laborers on the plantations uh, or uh, the wood used to build the barrels, um, that would contain the sugar and the molasses, whether it was uh, the uh, hardware or the horses or the grain, what have you, all of that came from New England to supply those West Indies. And so one project um, that we at Atlantic Black Box um, launched back in 2020, we called it the, uh, the Ship News Project, so the um, 1820 Ship News Project. And what we did was to work with students, um, in particular at USM, to take the Ship News column from uh, the earlier iteration of the Portland Press Herald, which was called the Eastern Argus newspaper. So take the Ship News column and parse that data. So what were the vessels arriving in Portland? Where were they coming from? Where were they sailing to? In, in, in certain cases, what were they carrying? Um, and in the course of uh, entering that data in a very simple spreadsheet, students came to realize that over half the trade in and out of Portland in that one year 1820 was with the West Indies directly, which is not to say that that is the only measure of complicity in the slave economy, because even the vessels that were headed up north to Newfoundland, et cetera, um, fishing 
That fish was then brought back to Portland and it was dried on racks and it was salted and then it was shipped down to the West Indies. So as um, Kate uh, McMahon will often say, you know, what vessel was not involved in the slave trade to some degree during that time? Uh, so those are the types of projects that um, we've been piloting. There are many, many more, uh, but a simple, you know, 1820, of course, is a very significant year. It's the year that Maine achieved independence. Um, and so we just thought it would be really interesting to have a snapshot of, you know, what, what should we be commemorating in 2020, uh, looking back on Maine's, um, you know, 200th anniversary and what built this place, you know? Um, so th yeah, that's an example of a project. Um, thank you, Meadow. And uh, one question that uh, was in the chat, uh, which is kind of directed uh, to us here at Freeport Historical Society, uh, ties into that a bit. And I wanted to, to just say, uh, so in response to Jonathan's question about um, what is Freeport Historical Society doing to um, sort of re-examine our own narratives? And I think the big part of that, um, as Meta has talked about, is finding the facts so that we can re-examine those narratives. Um, so in order to, to really tell the full story, we need to do our own research to see what is missing in our own records and how can we fill those in. Um, and as Meadows said, Kate McMahon, who we had present um, just about a month ago, um, has helped us in, in a great measure in terms of sharing with us things that she has found through other sources that relate back to Freeport, back to Freeport ship captains and ship builders. Um, and then we are also filling in uh, holes in, in narratives around um, some other folks that were involved in that wider Atlantic slave economy. And that specifically deals with trade with the West Indies or with products um, that, that came out of the West Indies. Um, one example of that that doesn't relate directly to the shipping industry um, is Barnabas Henry Bartol, um, who many of you know, um, the, the original building of the Freeport Public Library was named after. Um, Bar Barnabas Henry Bartol was born in Freeport, although he didn't actually spend most of his life here. He moved with his family when he was still very young to Portland. Um, when he was a young man, he moved immediately to, to West Point, to New York, uh, to learn uh, mechanical engineering. And and from there, he went directly to Cuba, uh, where he learned the sugar trade, and then moved to Philadelphia, where he opened his own sugar refinery. That is where the money came from for the $1,000 donation that he made to the town of Freeport, which had the public library named after him. Um, those are important parts also of, of how we more mem memorialize um, certain people whose names we are all familiar with, but we don't know much about their uh, full story. Um, so there are folks like Rufus Soule and his nephew Francis Soule and other folks that were involved directly in um, the domestic and uh, transatlantic slave trade. And then we have other folks that were also involved in that wider economy. We need your help to try to dig in to find some of that information. So one of the things that Atlantic Black Box uh, does is um, help us organize a community research group. And we are, are certainly interested in forming a community research group here in Freeport that could help us not just with what is in our own archive, um, that, that may be hidden in there, uh, but just as likely things that are not in our collections, but that information may be available somewhere else. So um, you'll be hearing more about this as we um, move toward reopening to the public next year, um, where we will have a new research room and really be able to invite people to come in and utilize our own records, um, but also uh, this is something that, that goes beyond our 
walls uh, out into the community and some of those sources that Meadow talked about um, from cemeteries to to log books that may be in other places uh, to genealogical or family records and that is still work that we're actively engaged in um, that will shape how we tell the stories um, whether they're through our own programs or as has been mentioned in the chat um, the information that we're able to share um, with other educators, um, both both in Freeport Public Schools and in other places. I'm gonna take a look at the chat and see. Yeah, I saw one question about the stench uh, of the diseased ship. Was the horrible stench uh, from the deceased people who must have been in the hold? And the answer uh, is yes. Um, that the the smell is uh, one of the most compelling pieces of evidence um, that indicate that there were enslaved people. It's essentially, you know, what remains. Um, it's very well known among scholars of the slave trade that the smell of a slave ship was absolutely horrific and it was distinct. There was nothing else that smelled like it because it's the smell of human suffering. It's the smell of, um, well, you can imagine. Uh, and on top of, you know, uh, being in, in an, a very small enclosed space with other people uh, for endless months, um, you know, with sickness, vomit, uh, everything. Uh, then death, right? The smell of death. Uh, so yeah. Nope. Um, someone uh, also in the chat, uh, Link actually uh, talked about some research that has been done that he believes is at Maine Maritime Museum. Um, I think we are um, looking forward to perhaps partnering with um, other other historic organizations here in Maine, particularly Maine Historical and Maine Maritime Museum um, as a part of this research. And I believe we have a look um, here with us from, uh, from Maine Maritime this evening. Um, so, so that is certainly an important resource for us to continue this work. It is super encouraging to see uh, institutions like yours, Eric, like uh, the Maine Maritime Museum, small historical societies to big, historical institutions, museums throughout the region, really coming around and taking up this critical work. Um, Kate and I, along with a couple other colleagues met uh, just yesterday with some researchers from Historic New England. They have 37 historic house museums in the region from Massachusetts, uh, Maine to uh, Connecticut. Uh, of which you know they are stewards and they have not traditionally been telling these stories. So these are some of the most, these were the homes of the these towns most prominent citizens, uh, the wealthiest citizens, right? Um, and and uh, now the organization has committed recognizing that this is work that it should have done all along. They've now committed to the resources and the time to doing this research. So they've hired four researchers uh, who have split up these 37 different sites amongst themselves and, um, and they are actively searching uh, to, to recover this suppressed history. Uh, so keep your eye on, on that evolution um, but also, you know, this is work being done by individuals like Leanne, like Beth Bauer, who's here um, somewhere. Uh, Beth, pop your camera on if, if you can, if you hear me. Uh, Beth is going to be giving a talk in just a couple of weeks for Atlantic Black Box on the enslaved people who were warned out of Salem. Beth, do you want to say a couple of words? Sure. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, I think uh, I'll be talking about how the archives can help us find people that we didn't think were there. Um, 
that not sometimes it's not just that people destroyed it, they just buried it. And, uh, and how the different laws were used uh, to actually record who was there. So I'm looking forward to that, thanks. Thank you, we can't wait. Um, someone's asking if uh, Kate's presentation is available online. Kate has been giving countless talks over the last couple of years. Um, so we certainly do uh, email uh, you can email info at atlanticblackbox.com or meadow underscore dibble at brown.edu and we can get you links. Um, absolutely. Uh, Kate mentions in the chat that the smell of the slave ship is also described in uh, Equiano's narrative. Um, you know, I said scholars talk about it, but you're absolutely right, Kate, that those who experienced uh, the horrific Middle Passage and who lived to tell the tale um, as Equiano did um, name name that stench um, as well. And it's always the, you know, when we have those narratives of people having survived the Middle Passage, um, that we need to center those. Those are extraordinary. Um, and we will uh, post both this presentation uh, and the recording of Kate's presentation um, from October um, on our Facebook page very shortly. So those will both be available, um, possibly linked on our website as well, um, if we can find the, the appropriate way to do that. Um, I don't see any other questions, but I want to give um, one last chance for anyone. Um, this has been a really, really important, uh, Meadow, and I thank you for your time uh, in helping us do this. Uh, I want to say one word about, uh, even though nobody has mentioned it, I, I think one of the things um, hanging in the, in the room is um, the question about rewriting history. And I, I think when we start to re-examine narratives that have become very comfortable, it obviously makes people uncomfortable. And I, you've talked about some of the resistance you faced in Brewster. Uh, I would expect that we might face some resistance here in Freeport as well. Um, but I think just to remember that history always changes. History always changes when we learn new information um, and because the context in which we're telling history always changes because the present is always changing. Uh, and we need to recognize, as, as you shared, Meadow, the context where we live now and what people are looking for, what, what people need to know about our own history. Um, and, and to be able to do that, we need the full story. Um, and so this is really important work that you are doing and sharing with us and that um, important work for us to participate in uh, both at the local and the regional level. Um, so thank you. Absolutely. If I could just um, encourage folks, you know, to have a look at the Atlantic Black Box website, uh, you'll find many resources. It can be very intimidating at the outset uh, to try to break into this research, um, you know, where does one begin? But again, I, I think so much just starts with asking basic questions um, and, and, and asking folks around town, go to your library, you know, um, go to your town clerk, uh, you know, ask the folks who, um, who have access to, uh, to records um, but also come, come join us. Um, <clears throat> we have a membership program and, you know, for a small fee or no fee at all, if you can't afford it, uh, you can become a member of Atlantic Black Box. Um, one of the most immediate benefits is you can join us every month when we gather uh, for our monthly research forum, where we bring in scholars like Kate, like Beth Bauer, like um, Pat Wall, um, many others, and, uh, and we just have an informal conversation. How do we do this work? How, we ask them, you know, what sources did you use? Um, what did you find most helpful? Where do you look if you're looking for this particular type of document? What do you do when you encounter an obstacle? Uh, 
et cetera. And then we all, and I know Luke and, and some others who are here, Craig, um, have come to our sessions. They're really just wonderful conversations where uh, researchers of all types can just share what they're learning and help to enlighten one another. Um, we just at Atlantic Black Box believe strongly that, you know, our most important resources are not money. Um, and you don't have to have a degree in history to do this work. Our most important resource is time. All of us have it. Even if you think you don't, believe me, as a single mother with two young girls um, and a full-time job, I do Atlantic Black Box in my spare time. We have the time. We can find the time. It's a matter of commitment, you know? So are these questions worth asking? Are they worth answering? If you say yes, but you don't know how to get started, just come join us, right? Don't let anything stop you and we'll figure it out together. So thanks once again, everyone, for your time and attention. Thanks for coming. Thank you for the invitation. We look thank forward you, to seeing what and, you come up with. And, and thank you, all of you, for taking the time this evening. Uh, at this very busy time of year, uh, we appreciate your time and your, your attention here. So um, thanks again, and uh, we'll post the recording very soon. So you can share it even more widely. Thanks, Meadow. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.